All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, good evening, and welcome to um, what is the closing public event uh, here at the Azriel Institute of Israel Studies. My name is Chaba Nikolini, I'm the director of the Institute, I'm also a professor at the Department of Political Science, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Department of Political Science for lending us this beautiful seminar room for the purposes of this uh, very important lecture uh, that, uh, that we invited you to join us uh, for tonight. It's, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to bring to you a very distinguished guest and visitor, Dr. Olaf Glöckner, who is visiting us from Germany, from the University of Potsdam, where he is uh, head of the uh, Sociology of Judaism department, and he's also a senior researcher uh, at the Moses Mendelssohn Center for European Jewish Studies. Dr. Uh, Olaf Glöckner uh, wrote his PhD on the topic, uh, which is also going to be the topic uh, of tonight's lecture, as you see on the slide behind me, Immigrated Russian Jewish Elites uh, in Israel and Germany. Uh, he's also very widely published, a very prolific scholar, and us being an Israel Studies Institute, I specifically want to mention a recent publication, an edited volume that he co-edited, uh, co-authored, uh, the Handbook of Israel, Major Debates, which I believe was published by uh, one of the European press. The, the Greuther, the Greuther, yes. So um, Dr. Glockner is visiting Montreal uh, because he's also participating in uh, a comparative Holocaust uh, conference uh, that is organized at Vanier College and hosted uh, at Vanier College. And I would also like to note and publicly acknowledge the generous contribution of uh, Hillel Montreal, represented tonight uh, by Miss Naomi Mazur. Uh, thank you again, Naomi, uh, and thank you, Marlene, uh, who, uh, for your representation of the college and for bringing Dr. Dockner uh, to our campus. We are truly very lucky and fortunate to have such a distinguished visitor with us. Uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Glockner. Um, the um, agenda is very simple. Uh, he is going to speak for about 50 minutes. I'm going to give him a five minute uh, heads up just to make sure that uh, after a 45 minute lecture, after talking for 45 minutes, he will wind up uh, uh, and, uh, and finish uh, in, uh, in the last five minutes. And then there will be still time uh, for you to ask your questions. So, um, so please um, uh, sharpen your pencils uh, and, um, and be ready with your, with your questions and observations. Uh, tonight's event is uh, taped. We also like to tape our event, and of course, uh, Dr. Glockner was uh, generous enough and kind enough to agree to that. And we do that so that uh, the talk could be made available on our YouTube channel also. So uh, if you have friends uh, who couldn't make it tonight, please refer them to the YouTube video, which will be on our website uh, in about a week, uh, a perhaps a little bit more. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I give you Dr. Olaf Glockner. Thank you very much for having the opportunity today to speak here in your institute. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the topic on which I want to speak here tonight is strongly touching contemporary jury in Germany. That's a really surprise. And as strange as it, as it may sound, in a certain way, the Russian Jews, I will explain what I mean with the Russian Jews later on, they, are, they have become a kind of hope for the future jury in Germany. Eighty years ago, at the end of the World War II, of course, nobody was thinking about a Jewish future in Germany, the country of Schiller and Goethe, of Mozart and Beethoven, but also of Adolf Hitler and Heinrich Himmler. During World War II, the German Nazis and their allies had systematically killed six million Jews in Europe the biggest genocide that ever happened in human history. <coughs> Up from 1945, not only the question arised whether Jewish life in Germany would have any perspective, but even whenever, whatever Jewish life would have any future chance in Europe itself. But in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, an unexpected Jewish immigration wave started that partly took the direction to Germany, partly. These people have been Eastern European Jews, Russian speaking, or more precisely, Jews from the just crumbling Soviet Union. 
It was not at all the first time that a huge number of Eastern European Jews decided to leave their home countries and to try a new beginning anywhere else in the world. For example, alone from 1881 till 1925, two million Jews from the Russian Tsarist Empire escaped from bad living conditions and poverty, and not a few escaped, escaped from the strong anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish pogroms, so typical for the late Tsarist era. Not all of the Russian Jewish emigres of that time went to America, a considerable number did also move to Palestine. Distinct Zionists who came were highly motivated to build up a modern Jewish state. Some other Russian Jews and non-Jews had escaped Russia directly after the Bolshevist Revolution and settled then in European metropolitan towns like Berlin and Paris. However, in the course of the 1920s, the situation for the Jews in Russia and its bordering countries became even more worse when the communists succeeded to form their own empire, the so-called USSR. Some of the Jews were eager to join the communist project, but others who still wanted to leave the country now found themselves in a trap. During World War II, many Soviet Jews became again strong patriots of their country despite the fact that it was ruled by the infamous dictator Josef Stalin. So the Soviet Union was attacked by Hitler and the German army and it became the main challenge for the USSR to stop and destroy the so-called Third Reich. However, after the successful, tragic, but finally successful Great Patriotic War, Stalin became a terrible anti-Semite and his successors Khrushchev and Brezhnev were not much better. The Soviet Union did a lot to support <coughs> Arab frontier states in their permanent wars against the young state of Israel, thus humiliating the Jews inside the Soviet Union as well. More and more Soviet Jews wanted to leave the country again, but only a part of them was permitted to do so during some short periods of war between the superpowers USSR and the USA in the 1960s and the 1970s. The Soviet Union mutated to a kind of modern prison repressing political independence, but more worst, being very hostile to any forms of organized Jewish life, maybe, may it be Jewish religion, culture or arts. When the communist reform president Mikhail Gorbachev came in office in 1985, he quickly started to liberalize uh, state politics towards the ethnocultural minorities in all their all these kind of ethnocultural minorities, but this came obviously too late. Shocked by new waves of anti-Semitism by political chaos and economic disaster at the end of the 1980s, also shocked by the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine and by emerging civil wars in Middle Asian Soviet republics, many Soviet Jews were just waiting for the first chance to escape from the country now. And indeed, by the end of the 1980s, Mikhail Gorbachev agreed to open the doors and immediately a great Jewish exodus came into move. According to a census, a Soviet census from 1988, still about two million Jews were living in the USSR. Now the overwhelming majority of these Jews went to the Israeli, American and German embassies applying for visa into one of these countries of destination. There was in general no surprise that a very huge number of Soviet Jews headed for Israel. For many decades, the Jewish state had fought for freeing the Soviet Jews, and yes, Israel as a Zionist Jewish immigration country wanted them all. Not all the emigres went there, but finally it came about one million. One million went to Israel during the 1990s. It was also less surprising that another considerable number of Soviet Jews just headed for the US, the old traditional promising country of destination since the late 19th century. More than 300,000 Soviet Jews took this route. In contrast to this, it became an extremely surprise that a third group did neither prefer the US nor Israel but tried their new beginning in reunifying Germany. 
Of course, the Cold War had been finished and the Berlin Wall had been fallen and the Germans in East and West were busy to come together. The new Bundesrepublik Deutschland was considered skeptically at the very beginning but then appeared as a very European oriented state, very strong in economy again, but without any nationalist or military ambitions. Indeed, Germany had more or less completely changed within a few decades, but was this enough reason to resettle there, even as Jews? Many observers had serious doubts, and the political elites in Israel was, of course, they were very angry that finally more than 200,000 Soviet Jews did not aliyah but moved to the country of the former Nazi offenders. In the result of this huge Soviet Jewish exodus at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, more Russian-speaking Jews live now outside of their former home countries and we might say they are living new, now they are living around the globe. Many of them in Israel, in the US, in Germany or better in Central Europe, but also a considerable number of them in Australia and in Canada. Russian-speaking Jews are well interconnected across borders. Some sociologists even speak of a Russian-Jewish transnational diaspora and it might be an interesting question what will bind them together also in the long run. But now let's turn to the special topic of tonight, a comparison of the immigrant Russian-Jewish elites in Israel and Germany since 1989. Up from the early 1990s, Israel and Germany have become the most important destinations for Russian-speaking Jews, or if we want to, for former Soviet Jews. The American closed the borders uh, in 1990. There's only family reunification now for Jews from Eastern Europe. Of course, they entered the Soviet Jews to Israel and to Germany. Of course, they entered two completely different worlds. Israel, as a country that understands itself as a Jewish state, a Jewish immigration country, where Jews are invited and expected to live as Jews, a country where anti-Semitism and Jew hatred are absent, but also a country that is running a lot of unsolved conflicts, first of all with the Palestinians. Germany, as a country with an extremely dark Nazi past, after 1945, mainly avoided by Jews, but now one of the most important countries inside the European Union, a bulwark of democracy now, and a country with one of the best social welfare systems worldwide. In Israel, the, immigrants of the immigration of Jews from the former Soviet Union was perceived as an essential event, as a vital issue. And indeed, the one million Jews from the former Soviet Union brought an increase of the Jewish population by about 20%. In Germany, the coming 230,000 former Soviet Jews got a formal welcome, but didn't cause huge attraction in general. In the Russian-speaking population in Germany, that counts about 3 million people in minimum. However, it quickly became clear that the, these newcomers would bring drastic changes inside the Jewish communities in Germany, and indeed, the number of registered Jewish community members tripled within a few years. In Israeli society, the Russian Jews quickly became a self-confident group and even an important factor in public and political life. I will explain it later on. But in Germany, they became the most important group inside the Jewish communities. And this, of course, came also as a huge surprise. What kind of group are these former Soviet Jews moving to Israel, the US, Germany and some other places around the world? The most, the most distinct feature, feature is for sure their huge professional qualification. About 70% of these immigrants are holding an academic degree and more than 90% are urban dwellers. At the same time, Russian-speaking migrants have a relatively high mean age and a very low birth rate. In general, the Russian-speaking Jews are very much interested, aside their high qualification and professions, very much interested in arts, cultural life, politics and society. 
What makes the Russian Jewish elites so self-confident on the one hand in their new countries and societies and on the other hand also very self-confident inside the global world Jewry? I would suggest that this has a lot to do with the myth and concept of the so-called Russian Soviet intelligentsia. Original, the term stems from Russian humanists and writers of the 19th century in the late Tsarist Empire, people like Tolstoy and Chekhov, non-Jews. And it described an elitist group feeling special obligation for improving society and culture, idealists. This original Russian intelligentsia was more or less completely destroyed by Stalin. Wait. Intelligentsia, it survived, and especially during the era of uh, Klasnost and Perestroika, which was initiated by the reform president Mikhail Gorbachev, the term came back and was just describing persons which really tried in an idealistic way to, to reform or to improve society and, and culture. And final, finally, Jews from the former Soviet Union, they brought the term with them to Israel and applied them for their own Russian Jewish, Russian speaking Jewish um, elites. Before we come closer to these kinds of uh, Russian Jewish elites, a short overview seems necessary on the Russian Jewish influx affected Germany and Israel up from the 1990s. Um, that's a little bit, uh, uh, now it's, it, it's really a bit sad because I have some graphs and some tables I tried to describe it. There have been just uh, about 230 uh, Jews from the former Soviet Union went went to Israel and uh, they went to Germany to Israel one million and the Jewish communities in Germany after 1945 they have been extremely small communities even a few months and and, and uh, years after the end of World War II Jewish communities were refounded but their, the number of their members was extremely low. And uh, I mean, this is what happened. This was going on wonderfully, and then, like, okay. yeah. This virtual magic is the end of the Exactly the table which um, uh, which I mean. You see the annual rates from uh, former Soviet Jews coming to Germany from 1991 till 2009. Of course, now we are 10 years later, but uh, in the last 10 years it was about a few hundred people coming to Germany from the former Jewish people from the former Soviet Union. Not more at all. So um, in the in the up from 2005, you see. The curve is going down, and it's more or less this this immigration, Jewish immigration wave to Germany is more or less uh, finished. But in some, it's about 230,000 Jews and their non-Jewish relatives. On this diagram, you can see uh, how the local Jewish communities would have been shrinked from their membership number, or even have collapsed without the Russian immigration this graph below and what happened like a little wonder stabilizing tripling of the number of Jewish community members in all these several uh, local Jewish communities in Germany this is the graph uh, above it's kind of a miracle and if Jewish communities are growing and growing and growing of course they need 
new synagogues and uh, new Jewish community centers. And with the support of the German state, there were built now in the last years a lot of new Jewish synagogues and, uh, um, and Jewish community centers combined, of course. These are the examples of the cities of Duisburg, Munich, Mainz, and Chemnitz. And these are only a few examples from a greater number of new synagogues in Germany. The Russian Jewish immigrants were welcome to back up and stabilize the Jewish populations in Israel and the Jewish communities in Germany. But like every migration group, of course, firstly, they had to solve their own basic problems as newcomers in a completely new surrounding. People need housing, schools, kindergartens for their kids, and of course, they need jobs as high qualified uh, professionals. As for the Russian Jews in Israel, Germany, and the US during the 1990s, <coughs> and the early, also the early 2000s, their entry on the labor market succeeded quite differently from country to country. Thus, within a few years, almost all of the Jewish, former Soviet Jewish immigrants in the US got a job while working, but in Israel it needed a longer time, and in Germany the unemployment rate among Russian-speaking Jews remained for a long time extremely high somewhere between 35 and 40 percent. This was all the more surprising in light of the huge qualifications which the immigrants brought with them, doctors, professors, nature scientists, engineers. Of course, most of the immigrants wanted to come back to their original high-level jobs and positions they had in the former Soviet Union, but only in a few cases this worked in Germany. <coughs> At the end of the day, many former Soviet Jewish professionals were extremely disappointed when they realized that they had no chance to get back into their original jobs in Germany and the German society allegedly didn't need their potentials and resources. These kind of frustrations, I think, might be one of the explanations why Russian Jews in Germany did not even partly identify with their new surround as the same group did quickly in Israel and in the US. However, such problems of entering the labor market or feeling no part of the new society are almost completely absent already for the second generation of Russian Jews in Germany. Most of them have already studied at German schools and universities. They are fluently speaking German, have multicultural networks, and they are on the best way to become German middle class. They are the generation of hope, not only for their parents, but also for the German Jewry in general. <coughs> the new generation of Jews in Germany is basically very self-confident, fully aware of their huge potentials in cultural, intellectual, and artistic life. Some of them are already very famous also among non-Jewish German audience, as for example the theater author Mariana Salzmann and the well-known writers Vladimir Kamina, originally from Moscow, and Lena Gorelik, and originally from Leningrad. Another surprise regarding this new second generation, mainly from Jewish families from the former Soviet Union, is that some of them really turn back to their Jewish religious roots. You know, former Soviet Union, a communist dictatorship for 17 years, had almost uh, completely destroyed all kinds of Jewish community life. <coughs> so it is no surprise that most of the parents who came to Germany had no connection to religion anymore. But a part of this young second generation turns back to their religious Jewish roots. Some of them attend study programs in Potsdam and in Berlin. There's a liberal rabbinical school in Potsdam now and the orthodox rabbinical school in Berlin and they become liberal or orthodox rabbis. And another surprise, um, is that some of the young, talented, uh, Russian-speaking Jews from this new generation 
also start to intervene in politics and they want to be respected as both as new German politicians and as young Jews in Germany, what is also important for them. Two examples, <coughs> Sergei Lagodinsky, born in Astrakhan in Russia. He came to Germany when he was a teenager, then he worked for the American Jewish Committee, did some semesters in Harvard, returned to Germany again, and now he is a candidate for the Green Party for the European elections in May of this year. And Marina Weisband, she was born in Kiev, Ukraine. She was the first CEO of the Young Party of the so-called Pirates, the Young Alternative Party also, which mainly cares for a new dealing with, with data, with electronic data. In my view, these young people, not only in politics, but also in arts and religion and elsewhere, inside and outside the Jewish communities, do already present a kind of nucleus for a coming Jewish elite in Germany, which is definitely different than those Liebermanns, Mendelssohns and Einsteins which dominated Jewish life in Germany before 1933. It is something completely new and the coming years will show us how the new generation of Jews in Germany will not only form the Jewish communities but maybe also affect public life in the Berlin Republic. Now let's quickly switch to Israel where the arrivals almost one where almost one million former Soviet Jews came and caused at least at the beginning a certain kind of uh, euphoria in the public. Israel was waiting all the decades for the Soviet Jews and now they come as uh, one million Jews. Soon it became clear that the newcomers and their elites were a quite heterogeneous, highly qualified layer with own ideas, with own ideas how to insert into Israeli society, how to contribute with their special capacities and resources and ideas to the Jewish state, but also how to get through their own interests. Among the Jews who came to Israel during the 1990s, and did Aliyah where we could find very distinct elite groups of elites, I will explain. Cultural elites, writers, artists, intellectuals, which had already a great name in the Soviet Union before, and of course, the mass of immigrants from the form from the USSR looked up to them. Among the Russian Jewish elites coming to Israel at that time were also tens of thousands of scientists, business elites, including famous tycoons and oligarchs, in sum, a lot of people who felt closely connected with their own group, willing to integrate into Israeli society, but also willing to contribute in their fields of expertise, also to uh, yes, in their field of expertise, and also to shape Israeli society. One of the first groups have who became who appeared in, in the public uh, where those uh, into and, and started started uh, public discussion have been Jewish writers of the middle aged generations, also with former Soviet uh, roots. Authors like Igor Guberman and Dina Rubina became celebrated figures, admired not only by Russian Jewish readership in Israel, but also in the US, in Germany and elsewhere. They succeeded in reflecting exactly the feelings of Jews who had experienced half-life in the communist Soviet Union, but who felt homeless in communist surrounding, uh, but also faced difficulties to become domestic and home-like in Israel, Germany, and other modern countries of destination. Additionally, it has been the Russian theater authors and players who made huge headlines in Israel from the very beginning and started to shape the Seattle landscape in Israel from anew since the beginning of the 1990s. Especially the early founded Seattle Gesher in Tel Aviv became attractive and famous but also contested from the very beginning. Former Leningrad and Petersburg Seattle managers Yevgeny Arye and Lena Kreindlin founded Gesher, the bridge, already at the beginning of the 1990s, and the municipality of Tel Aviv arranged a building for them in Tel Aviv 
Yafu, they are still there. The, the main building of Gesha Sierra is still in Tel Aviv. Yafu, anybody has been there already? Okay. <laughs> yes. The name of the Sierra Gesha, the bridge, is almost, uh, we can say it's almost the program to bridge the gap between different parts of Israeli society. Gesher Company wanted to perform for the lots of Russian Jews who had come with them in the same huge wave of more, one million former Soviets to ease their life, to inspire them, to give them new courage. At the same time, the artists from Gesher want, wanted to attract a native Israeli audience, making them familiar with modern Russian theater, also with classical Russian theater, and at the same time bringing actual topics of Israeli society on stage. At the beginning, the Israeli media was very short-spoken or even hostile to them. In this first critical stage, maybe the crucial blessing and salvation was that Gesher won a lot of awards on international theater festivals, for example in New York and in Berlin and elsewhere. So they earned a lot of fame and glory for Israel in this field before they become accepted in their new own homeland. However, step by step, Gesher conquered also the Israeli audience. They started early to perform Russian in Russian and in Hebrew, I think even after one year. They, they, they established the theater in 91 or 1990 and one, one year later they tried to, 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 to perform the first place already in Hebrew language. And uh, yes, and also a lot of uh, young, talented native Israeli actors and actresses made then their first steps for the future career also on the stage of Gesha. Gesha is maybe the best example how Russian Jewish elites here in the sector of theater arts intend to practice and to live integration. For the tens of thousands of former Soviet scientists who came to Israel within the 1990s, Successful integration was also a very hard fight under different circumstances compared with the artists, but nevertheless a huge challenge. For example, lots of chemists, physicists, mathematicians and neurobiologists came to Israel, quickly starting with applications for letters of patent, publishing in international journals and so improving Israel's image as a science nation quickly. A completely different elitist world of Russian-speaking Jews appeared in the Israel of the 1990s with the so-called Russian oligarchs. These persons has entered, had entered the path of economic success during the so-called wild years in Russia and in the other successor states of the former Soviet Union. Some entrepreneurs of Jewish origin had appeared as extremely successful uh, yet in the Russia of Boris Yeltsin, as for example, Vladimir Gusinski, Boris Berezovsky, Roman Abramovich, Leonid Neftlin, and Levi Levayev. When Vladimir Putin succeeded Boris Yeltsin in the year of 2000 in his presidential office, new conflicts emerged, new fights for power and influence, but also harsh personal conflicts. In the result, for some of the Russian Jewish oligarchs, as for example for Leonid Neftlin and for Vladimir Gusinski, Israel became just a safe heaven in face of hard Russian persecution, official Russian persecution. For instance, Israel rejected to extradite Leonid Neftlin to the Russian officials, well aware what had happened with Neftlin's colleague at the Yukos company, Yukos oil company. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who was sentenced to more than 10 years in jail when Putin wanted to make an example on him. Nefzin, in turn, became one of the biggest fin philanthropists in Israel, supporting research on Jewish history inside and outside Israel and helping to save and restore modern Jewish museums. This is done mainly by the Nefzin Foundation in Israel. Other oligarchs like Levi Levayev and Vladimir Gusinski have strongly invested in the Israel media sector while not having forgotten the Russian-speaking audience. Levayev has funded the Russian-speaking TV channel 9, Arutz Tesha, and Gusinski invested a lot in the international channel RTVI. 
Thus, in a certain way, these oligarchs are very present in the public, are interested to affect public opinion, but also offer platforms for, Russian, for a Russian-Jewish kind of reporting, which was, at least at the beginning of the Great Russian Aliyah, far away from being welcome in Israel. So they made their own platforms for debates and discussions and have their own information. These problematic attitudes came along with some years in the 1990s in which the practical integration of many Russian Jews also seemed to stagnate. Also at the labor market at this time, not as strong problems like in Germany, but also a lot of problems with integrating highly qualified persons, bad reporting about them, bad images, uh, ignoring different problems. So what, uh, how did the Russian-speaking Jews uh, react on such a problematic situation? Mm -hmm. They just reacted with the establishment of our political parties, Russian parties, and at least two of them became quite successful. Firstly, leading figures of the immigrants, scholars by the way, from the groups of the 1970 immigrants and the 1990 immigrants, they came together, they made a lot of brainstorming and they developed, uh, they developed a concept for a political party called Isra Israel Baalia, led by former dissident Nathan Sharansky, that entered the Knesset after the elections of 1996 and immediately joined the government. In 1999, Israel Beitanu, a second very successful Russian party led by Moldovian-born Avigdor Lieberman, so similar success. For a couple of years, both parties gathered in some about 50% of the complete Russian electorate. Soon after joining government coalitions, especially Israel Baalia could help to push through the first improvements for the Russian-speaking immigrants. For example, special programs to integrate people with academic background, Beyond this, Israel Baalia worked on compromise regulations for non-Jewish Russians and tried to start a housing construction program for elderly immigrants with low incomes. After 2006, about 10 years later, the Russian parties step by step lost their importance. However, you know, Avigdor Lieberman, as we know, he is still very present as a, dis as a distinct right-wing national right-wing nationalist top political leader. The Russian political parties in Israel presented a very unique phenomenon in the history of the state of Israel. Rather, ethnic-oriented parties haven't been really accepted uh, before. So, especially Israel Baalia and Israel Beitanu have also symbolized the enormous talents and resources of the Russian-speaking Jews regarding political self-organization. In all the years, obviously, it remained for the huge Russian-speaking Jewish community in Israel also important to have their own media, in Russian language, of course, where they conduct their disputes, where they raise their independent voice, also in the direction to Israeli government, and from where they draw important impulses for their own collective identity. During the, during the years, lots of Russian Jewish newspapers, weeklies, and journals appeared. New appeared, some others have gone, and then also a Russian speaking radio broadcast called Reka came on stage. Finally, also the previous, year, previous year, uh, mentioned TV channel the Nine Aruz Tesha. Regarding the Russian print media, the newspaper Vesti, the name is uh, in English news, news succeeded at the leading voice of the Russian community in Israel until today. And regarding online media, the portal Make News Come is still playing an important role. So Russian Jews in Israel are in a certain way also have become opinion makers, attracting also for some other population groups. The strong Russian media sector built by the immigrants up from the 1990s show us that cultural self-assertion of the immigrants continued more or less still today. And in this media sector and also in diverse Russian literature outlets, for example, Tva Tsa Tva, 22, the intelligentsia is well present and provides their own suggestions and ideas also how to continue or to change politics in Israel. And at this point, of course, 
there is not a realistic a comparison between Israel and Germany possible because the Russian Jews in Israel, via their own media, via, via their own uh, political parties and platforms, they have much more opportunity to, to affect political, social and, and cultural life. So we have a, an imbalance in the comparison at this, at this point. So let's come to the last point of comparison. How do Russian Jewish immigrants and their elites have in fact changed and affected the host societies in the countries, in their countries of destination, Israel and Germany, in the course of the recent 25 or 30 years? For Israel, I would suggest or conclude that the Russian speaking Jews have uh, westernized uh, daily life in Israel in a certain way. They have Europeanized the arts. They have given huge impulses for science and technology. They have liberalized economy and uh, also an important aspect, they have also stretched in the political landscape, they have stretched uh, strange uh, nationalist forces, most of the political parties, the Russian political parties in Israel have more uh, a turn to the turn to the right. Not only Israel Beitanu by Avigdor Lieberman. Regarding Germany, the Russian speaking Jews have, at least in the young generation, already reached the middle class. Uh, it will become an interesting thing to what point this new generation, some of them I told, some of them got religious but some of them are still busy with uh, just uh, managing their own life. They have finished uh, academic studies now, they have founded uh, families, they settled down. So in a few years it will be a crucial point how many of these second generation of Russian Jews in Germany will be interested uh, A, to join the Jewish communities, but also to be active inside the Jewish communities or not. The Russian Jews, Russian speaking Jews in Germany have taken over more or less the majority in the Jewish communities. It is estimated that about 90% of all members in the Jewish communities, of course it's different from city to city, the Jewish community in Frankfurt and Main has a different composition to that in Munich and different to that in, in Berlin. But all in all, it is estimated that about 90% of the current Jewish community members in Germany uh, have a Russian-speaking family background. So they have taken over more or less. And it, it, it will depend on the future. The future of the Jewish, the organized Jewish life in Germany will depend on these Russian-speaking immigrants, especially in the second generation. Some of the Russian-speaking artists, especially the younger ones, are very renowned, as I mentioned, committed in the German public, and uh, some of the artists, interestingly, also are very much uh, politicized, but they are more politicized in the, in the direction of the left. This is a completely new self-confidence among Jews, young Jews in post-war Germany, it never appeared before that uh, young Jews want to be, they want to be shown, they want to be in the public, they want to discuss, they want to intervene, and uh, until today they are not scared about to show their new self-confident uh, Jewishness. Two questions, remains, two questions remain open for the near future, I guess. One question, will the concept of Russian-speaking Jewish elites, these kind of Jewish intelligentsia, what I tried to describe, still be relevant for the second and third generation of the immigrants, of the Russian-speaking Jewish immigrants? Do they need such a kind of elite, such a kind of uh, intelligentsia? Or will these new generations just become well-absorbed Israelis and Germans? And another question, will there be any kind of transnational Russian-speaking Jewish diaspora around the globe in the long run? Or will time dissolve these formerly strong cultural boundaries, transnational cultural boundaries, uh, will they be dissolved also with the time? Thank you.
Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, I didn't even have to remind you of the time. You were so <laughs> punctual. I and I would, to be disciplined. <laughs> and I would like to thank you again for your cool and patience while we were resolving the technical issue. So we have some time for uh, a Q&A. Um, so uh, the floor is open. Um, if uh, We all know, of course, uh, Olaf, Dr. Glöckner. If you don't mind just identifying yourself uh, so that uh, uh, Olaf would also know who you are. Please. Yes. Uh, my name is Mathieu Gelbard. I'm a student in um, religious and politics at the University of Montreal. And previously, I've been a student in history at Sorbonne. Um, I really, there's something that is interesting me uh, uh, about uh, uh, Russian Jewish in, uh, in Germany. Yes. Uh, I come from a Polish community, and there's nothing more. Uh, there's nothing more in uh, Poland about. Uh, Jewish culture yeah. is uh, the the rich history of uh, G German Jewish a path to integration uh, in uh, Germany. And why are you speaking about integration or and no assimilation? How um, as over uh, European Jewish community? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, if I understand you right. I mean the, the the Jewish community in Germany before 1933, it, it they counted about a half million German Jews. Yeah. So and uh, it was more or less completely uh, destroyed. And uh, the former Soviet Jews they identified themselves not with this formerly German Jewry. They are not tying on this. Uh, they are not interested. Some of them are historians and they, they go to the archives and they just check and say, okay, we are now in the country uh, where former famous German Jews lived and, and, and maybe it's interesting for us as well. But this group of Russian Jews is so extremely self-confident. Even in the first generation, they, just, uh, they also say we bring Russian culture. We are Jews, we bring Russian cultures. We are not assimilating, never. No, we, not, we are not assimilating in Israel, not in, not in America, not in, in Germany. Integration is for them a kind of uh, mutual learning. So, uh, I mean, this, this, this example from the, from the Gesher Theater, this is an idealistic case. A new theater is coming, they, they have success, they uh, had to survive economically at the very beginning, and then they say, look, Israeli society, look, we bring a new kind of theater. You don't have this classical and modern Russian theater. We want to, per we want to perform in Russian language. You can learn Russian, you can learn Russian theater. We will do it in Hebrew. We are very open. We want to learn as much as possible from the news around. And this is our understanding of, of, uh, of, of integration. We are not going to, to be the same persons like uh, the natives. And uh, the other question, if I understood you right, uh, I know in Poland the Jewish community is, is almost uh, completely dissolved, yeah. except Krakow and Warsaw, and only a part, only a part of the uh, former Soviet Jewish immigrants and their, and their children only a part of them are interested in religion and the Jewish communities I know this is a, the modern understanding of Jewish communities is also kind of a place of social gathering and cultural points and all these things but uh, only a certain fragment of certain segment of this of this huge immigration wave it joined the Jewish community and, and they are not defining their path of integration into the, into the German overall society via the Jewish communities. The Jewish communities in Germany now, they are much more open-minded to general society than it was in the, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, but it's not necessarily a, a, a bridge to come to German overall society. Is it more or less yeah, answered? Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Another question. Okay. Uh, being the Taji, I'm a retired engineer. When Russian Jews came to uh, to Israel, yes. 
you know, they got rid of all their communists, communism habits, they, they, they just evaporated, or were they communists in Russia, or were they living in Russia? You mean, um, can you specify a question? <laughs> My question is, yes. when, when Russian Jews left yeah. uh, Russia, yeah. and they came to Israel, yes. they were communists. No, no, they, they were, uh, they, they arranged their life in, in the Soviet Union. There was a huge number of uh, Soviet Jews, they wanted to go out of the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s, but they could not get out. The, 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 the borders were closed, they had to apply to leave this country, to come out, and if they got if they got the, the permission to go out, for example, that they should have paid to the state lots of fees and money for their education and all this. The Soviet dictatorship did everything to make life for them worse the moment they applied for, for, for coming out to just for, to go out for Israel or to go out for the uh, United States. Uh, they had a kind of socialization, communist socialization, and of course the, you internalize some of these uh, habits. Uh, there is a bad word in some of the local Jewish communities in Germany. Uh, some, some of the critical native Germans today, they say, some of the new members in the communities, they are a kind of homo sovieticus. This is a very bad term, homo sovieticus. But this might be some kind of uh, social patterns, but from the political few, I would say maybe 1% of them remained communists. And then they wanted to go out and they had a lot of push factors, a lot of reasons to go. That's what I, that's what I mentioned. The Ukrainian Jews went, uh, they, they left because they had the atomic disaster in Chernobyl. Middle Asian Jews, they had civic wars. And in, the, in, the, in, in big Russian towns, at the end of the 80s, there were huge demonstrations, especially by a at the beginning, it was a cultural renewal movement that was called Pamyat. They started with, we want to come back to Russian cultural roots, but they became more and more anti-Semitic. And they shouted and demonstrated on the street. Thousands of people there. So there was also a kind of uh, panic and anxiety. We have to go out before it's too, too late. And when the Soviet, the former Soviet Jews, uh, there were some studies about the former Soviet Jews, especially in Israel and I think also in the United States, their political orientation after immigration, voting patterns, for example, in the United States, you know, majority of American Jews traditionally voting for the Democrats. The former Soviet Jews overwhelmingly voting for the, for the Republicans, more, much more in, 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 in the right-wing spectrum and, and also in Israel. So they, they, are, they are filled up. They, 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 they don't. Also, they, they don't like to hear any kind of socialist ideas and because they, they can be everything they, they, they understand. If they heard the word socialism, they think it has something to do with the former Soviet uh, dictatorship. And maybe that will turn in the, in the second generation, but the, the first generation is, is uh, completely conservative. Angela Merkel is a former communist who uh, was Sorry? Angela Merkel is a former communist who... Yeah, Merkel is different because... Merkel was, a, Merkel was a, an, an engineer in East Germany and maybe she was in the... But she's, in, she's conservative now. Yeah, but this is, this is a different case. <laughs> uh, Roy, you had a question, Roy, and then... Um, yeah, so my, one, my, my question was actually what you had asked at the end about, uh, inter about them integrating in the second and third generations. Um, so my question now is, so, like, uh, sociologists from Israel, like Sami Smucha, who are working on all this, theorize that uh, the Russian Jews will eventually assimilate in a sense with Ashkenazi mm -hmm. Jews mm -hmm. in Israel yeah. and uh, just form a new elite in the Ashkenazi court. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. One part is sort of a more obvious one, but why, of course, do you think this uh, immigration was so much more, as Smukha says, was so much more uh, successful than, for example, the Misrahi immigrations earlier? Yeah. Yeah. 
And what does this large, essentially Ashkenazi uh, immigration mean for the disparity between Ashkenazis claim in Israel? Yeah. I mean, in the in the 1990s, there were a lot of tensions between the, the, the Russian Jews and the Israeli Jews because the thanks to their huge professional qualification they had already in 1990s, some of the immigrants had problems, but but uh, a huge number they had uh, even during the 1990s they had a quick upward uh, mobility and and so they uh, they left uh, poor quarters quickly and and uh, and the point was at that in this stage during the 1990s in Israel most of the Russian Jews were distinct secular they said uh, they, they said to that was also they they didn't like too much compromises so simple example when the Russians came they said we want to eat pig <laughs> and, uh, we we are Jews and we are Israeli patriots but we are not going to eat kosher so so and and uh, the chief rabbiner they they tried to counter it uh, without success and now you have in in Israel you have uh, food chains Russian food chains and they they have their pig meat to eat so this was kind of a cultural fight but you know in the in the Mizrahi population for example many of the Mizrahis they are traditional voters for chess and they are at least uh, a certain percentage of them is very really religious and now the the Mizrahi, the native Mizrahi, they say they, they see the Russians are coming they are secular they are different they are more successful than us so there was a lot of uh, tensions especially in the in the in the 1990s with partly very uh, awful uh, results there are some killings some murders each other and and uh, but I think the, the differences in the in the second generation they will become uh, less because you you have intermarriage and you have all these things and, and, and so the I think the, the, the huge the, the very sharp cultural fight is over but one one problem uh, remains to my mind uh, inside of this one million uh, former Soviet immigrants about 300,000 are not Jewish according to the halacha. So they have Jewish father or any Jewish grandparent, and and, and this is a real problem because they cannot marry. Uh, they cannot marry in Israel. It's impossible. And and also, if you have young soldiers, elitist fighters uh, uh, in, in in special units, and if they die, they are not buried on a Jewish cemetery. Try to imagine. So this is and these are. Um, originally, the, the the Russian parties they were uh, they were entitled to solve the problems Israel by Leah and, and Israel by Tanya and they did not succeed. It's 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 still a real a real problem. And uh, regarding your first question, with the uh, yes, I think uh, Smucha is right, and they will more or less uh, absorb in the in the in the, in the Ashkenazi. Uh, upper class and, and but this has if that will have any uh, impacts on their political attitudes I'm not sure it's it's not yet clear with the, but I also think the some uh, I, it's not smucha but some of the the Israeli sociologists they just uh, claim now because of the one million Russians who came uh, to Israel Israel got the shift to the right this is only uh, part of the truth, only part of the truth. Uh, during the second intifada in Israel, a lot of other population groups also shifted to the right. So it's, it's and you have some, you still have some left-wing uh, politicians among the Russian Jews as well, but uh, currently they are the minority. Yes. My name is Raphael Blanc, I'm a history student from Concordia. Um, so I have like, three questions. Yes. So one is, um, how many Jews were there in Germany after the Holocaust? Yes. The other one is um, how many German Jews specifically came back after the Holocaust? Yes, 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 yes. How many came back? And how many non-Russian Jews are there in Germany now? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, at the end of the World War II, you had in, in on the German territory, there were about nearly 20,000 
originally German Jews. Some of them were hidden in the underground and some could save their life because they were married with non-Jews because of these uh, reasons. To my mind, um, maybe a few thousand, very few thousand or very or a few hundred German Jews uh, did Aliyah, but a part of them uh, returned, for example, in the, the 1950s and uh, in the 1960s. Germany never, never had a huge group of, of distinct Zionists after 45 who went to who went to Israel. So I cannot tell you an exact uh, figure about how many uh, German Jews who went to Israel and not said... With, not with Israel, just like how many Jews after the Holocaust were German Jews that lived in Germany? German Jews? Only, only 20,000. Wow. And, and um, yes, and what was the third? And the other part is like how many besides the Russian yes. Jewish yes. population in Germany? Yes. Yes. What's the general? Yes, the point is, the point is, um, some of these German Jews uh, they left, but not necessarily to Israel. And at the end of from 1945 until the late 1940s and early 1950s, there were uh, huge so-called camps for displaced persons, the so-called DP camps. And they were just told by the Allies, especially by the American, in the American and in the British sector. And inside these camps for displaced persons, they were, there were hundreds of thousands of Jews from Eastern Europe who had survived concentration camps and who were just expelled and who didn't want to go back. They never wanted to go back, for example, to Poland. After the pogrom of Kielce in '46, and when it became clear, the climate in Eastern Europe might be hostile against us again. We might come back to our cities, but most of our relatives and friends, they, they are murdered and, and uh, it makes no sense to go back. So uh, many of these so-called displaced persons, Eastern, mainly European, uh, Eastern European Jews, they were for, for a couple of time in these camps and then they went to, into the US, to Australia and a huge number to, to Israel. But especially um, Polish Jews, some of the Polish Jews, they remained also in Germany. And during the 1950s, the Polish Jews and some Hungarian Jews, they became the majority in these very, very small local Jewish communities in Germany. And this brought a lot of uh, changes because Eastern European Jews, if they are religious, traditionally they are Orthodox. And the German Jews before 1933, the overwhelming majority was liberal. But then they said, we are very small groups. What can we do? How can we uh, come together? How can we survive? And they developed this so-called model of uh, Einheitsgemeinde, a united community. That means all of them are in one community, but only the majority can hire a, a rabbi. So you have uh, conservatives, liberals, orthodox Jews inside one community, but only one uh, orthodox rabbi because the majority is Polish or, or Hungarian. So, and these small groups until the end of the 1980s the local Jewish communities altogether, they had not more than nearly 30,000 members. Now they have 100,000 members, the huge, huge, huge Russian uh, majority. But you still, if you have a closer look on this community, you still can see you have some German Jews, originally German Jews, you have the Polish Jews or their children or grandchildren, Hungarians, and, and now this huge group of uh, former Soviet Jews. Has there been like an immigration of Jews that's in the last decade or so? Out, out migrant? No, only the okay. former Soviet Jews. There is one new phenomenon, but uh, we have to treat it very uh, carefully. In, in, in Berlin, for example, you have about uh, 11, that's for sure. E even the Israeli embassy confirms in minimum 11,000 Israelis permanently living in Berlin. And I'm not speaking about Israeli tourists or about Israeli students. 
Um, to my feeling, it's a growing community. It's, of course, not that huge uh, group of Israelis like in, in, in Los Angeles or in, in, in Paris or in, in London. It's less. But there seems to be a kind of trend that uh, young Israelis, high qualified, secular, Ashkenazi Israeli Jews uh, are very attracted by the former Reichshauptstadt Berlin. <laughs> so it's, a, it's the next really, really uh, a surprise. And first studies are in progress now to find out what kind of people, what's the motivation, and if they go out of Israel, why not Paris, why not London, why uh, Berlin? But currently, uh, it seems that there are four subgroups of Israelis permanently living in, 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 in Berlin and in some other cities of Germany, but mainly in Berlin, uh, start-up entrepreneurs, artists, both groups just say they feel uh, more, they have more chances, more better perspectives to be successful start-ups and, and artists. Uh, LGBT, homosexuals and lesbians, LGBT scene uh, also attracted by Berlin, probably better for them than Tel Aviv even. And some, there's also a group of uh, politically uh, frustrated Israelis. But, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a very, very raw picture for now. It's not. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm Leonard. Thank you so much for your lectures. It was very informative. Thank you. I was wondering whether like the um, tendencies within the Russian Jewish communities in Germany are really distinct from any other um, migrant group to Germany or if it's just very similar to like there's a lot of like German Russians of German descent that came to Germany also yes. at that time and I was wondering whether they're really similar um, similar more maybe to the Russian Germans because they went through the same experience yeah. of the Soviet Union yeah. or if there's really something distinct about them having lived in the Soviet Union as Jewish people that yeah. has then make them assimilate differently into German society yeah. Yeah. also like if you maybe take Polish people of German descent like all these people from yeah. Eastern Europe that was, um, could, were able to like come to Germany yeah. I can speak only about those who came, those different groups who came from the former Soviet Union, ethnic Germans from the from the former Soviet Union. I don't know about Polish, but in uh, ethnic Germans from Poland. But there are um, there came about two million since the beginning of the 1990s, about two million ethnic Germans from these uh, successor states of the former Soviet Union. So you have 200,000. Russian Jews and two million German ethnics. Um, I think the contacts between them are not that much uh, in some of some cultural associations, and they, they just like still to be in in some kind of Nash, uh, Russian cultural uh, networks. There are, but the profile. Uh, they have one commonality in in the times of the Soviet Union. Both minorities were treated in a bad way, and there was political repression and cultural repression. And the, the German ethnics, most of them are Protestant Christians, and also all the the, the, the Soviets didn't like it. The Soviet dictatorship they didn't like it, but their profile as as migration groups is quite different because uh, German ethnics are not necessarily from these huge metropolitan towns, Moscow, uh, Leningrad, Petersburg, Odessa. It's less. Some of them are also from rural areas, also from uh, former Soviet republics like uh, Kazakhstan, for example. And they, in general, they have uh, they have. Uh, not academic uh, professions. So um, there was no study until now, to my mind, uh, who compared the success of integration of these uh, both groups. But uh, it is well known that, especially in the second generation, the German ethnics, it's surprising because they are the most privileged group. They get uh, the Russian Jews came in, but they didn't get a German citizenship. Ethnic Germans get a German citizenship. They get extra courses, for at least language courses, additional, some uh, easings for professional integration. 
but the second generation of ethnic Germans have a lots of problem, identity problems, youth delinquency, uh, um, not unemployment in generally, but a but lot of young people uh, broke off their education. And that was a couple of years ago. So the, the, the German state was, was alarmed because they thought, okay, this is a group of two million. If the second generation will fail their integration, we get a real problem. And the Russian Jews, uh, in contrast, the Russian Jews, uh, the, the second generation against their, their, their percentage of people who got high school and then start uh, academic study, so is even more than 17 now. So this, this is, everybody knows that the Russian Jews are a group without any problems in the second generation. That's, that's the difference. So we are going to have to stop here, but there will be still a few more minutes uh, remaining, um, I hope, I believe, to linger and maybe engage uh, um, uh, Olaf in a more informal sense. Uh, but we do have to conclude the formal part of the presentation. So let me ask uh, you please to join me in thanking once again Olaf with the round of applause. <laughs> Thank you really for this uh, superbly and eloquently delivered uh, insightful research on a very, very important topic. And we look forward to having you back uh, uh, sometime in the future. In 20 years. <laughs> and, uh, well, don't wait that long. Uh, we certainly made you sense, and we look forward to uh, welcoming you back. Thank you so much um, for this kind of reception. And before you would leave, uh, let me ask you to please make sure that you uh, leave your name, contact information on the signing sheets so that we would be able to communicate with you in the future uh, uh, about important upcoming events uh, such as the one that you were participating uh, in tonight. Uh, you will also find uh, two flyers about upcoming events. Uh, please help yourselves to uh, copies of each. On May 21st, um, on the topic of German jury, uh, we will be uh, welcoming and hosting Mr. Benjamin Ballant, uh, an author of uh, Hungarian descent, as the name uh, gives it away, uh, an author from Jerusalem who will be uh, launching in Montreal his uh, recently published new book, Kafka's Last Trial. Uh, it's a fascinating story of the cultural diplomatic battle, if you will, about the Kafka papers, the Kafka legacy involving uh, the German and Israeli governments, and as the flyer makes it clear, the two women caught in between. Uh, on May 28th, we will be uh, welcoming Yossi Klein Halevi from the Hartmann Institute in Jerusalem in cooperation with Federation CJA. Um, and uh, please make sure to, uh, to check the details on the flyer. If you have any questions uh, about either or both of those events, please uh, do contact us at the Israel Institute of Israel Studies. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Um, if you have any questions to, uh, to address to Olaf, uh, Olaf, if you have a few more minutes uh, in an informal capacity, um, uh, please uh, take advantage of his presence. And uh, other than that, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.